introduction once you uh, got it. Right, right the appointed hour, six o'clock having been reached, I welcome everyone to this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, my name is Dylan Maxfield. As vice chair of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, I call this meeting to order in absence of chair Steve Judge. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, and extended again by state legislature on July 16th, 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meeting recordings may be viewed via the Town Amherst uh, YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. Uh, for public comment, please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. Uh, if you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. Uh, when called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the chair. If a speaker does not comply with the uh, guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Uh, in accordance um, with provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority, the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarifications or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate using the raise hand function on their screen or star nine if they're calling in from a phone. The chair with the assistance of staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, present your full name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the application tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits and the board is not ruled by precedent. Uh, statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearings to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of the filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. Uh, tonight's agenda will be a roll call and then public hearing uh, for ZBA FY 2018-3 and ZBA FY 2020-18, followed by a public meeting on ZBA FY 2018-03 and ZBA FY 2020-18, uh, followed by a uh, general discussion on the board, um, as well as uh, business not anticipated within uh, the last 48 hours. Uh, with that being said, we have in panel tonight, um, we have our regular members, uh, myself, Dylan Maxfield, <laughs> Tammy Parks, and Craig Meadows, and associate members, Sarah Marshall and Vince O'Connor. With that, we will begin uh, with roll call vote. Uh, the chair, Dylan Maxfield, is here. Tammy Parks? 
Here. Craig Meadows. Here. Sarah Marshall. Here. Vince O'Connor. Here. Excellent. Um, so with that, we will move on to ZBA FY 2018-03 and ZBA FY 2020-18. So uh, procedurally, we need to open up the public hearing. Uh, do I have such a motion to do so? So moved. I'll second. And so Connor moves, Sarah Marshall seconds. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, chair votes aye. Uh, Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. O'Connor? Aye. Uh, Ms. Marshall? Aye. And Mr. Meadows? Aye. All right, with that open, uh, let's go ahead and get our panelists in here. Who will be presenting for the applicant tonight? We have let's see, uh, Mr. Tom Reedy and also yeah, Pete Wilson, who are in the attendees. Mr. Reedy actually suggested in a different uh, meeting we were holding to um, promote uh, uh, promote those speakers to panelists so they can show their video. If that sounds good, I will uh, do so. Um, sounds good. We can demote them afterwards. But there may be an interruption for them. How are you, Mr. Reedy? Pretty well, Mr. Chair. How are you? Doing well. Good. Have we got everyone in? Is it uh, yourself and uh, Pete Wilson? Pete Wilson, yeah. It'll be the two of us. All right, wonderful. Um, go ahead, state your uh, name and address for the record. Sure, and I don't know if you want to read the public hearing notice before we get going. No. All right, done. Do I have the uh, public hearing notice? It's in the agenda. It's just what you said for the public hearing, but most oftentimes the chair will read it just into the record. Yeah, so the full, uh, just the public hearing, got it. We can do that. So we have a public hearing for ZBA FY 2018-03 and ZBA FY 2020-18 Wilson Properties Group LLC request for approval of submissions in fulfillment of condition nine, the special permit ZBA FY 2018-03 dash zero three as extended by ZBA FY 2020 dash 18 related to the creation of two flag lots, not part of a definitive subdivision condition nine that requires new property owners come before the board at a public hearing to review the home location and propose screening plans along property lines at 43 and 45 Canton Avenue, uh, Canton Avenue and 45 Canton Avenue uh, map 11 D parcels 281 uh 189 and 194. perfect thanks thanks mr chair uh for the record tom reedy attorney with bacon wilson here in amherst here on behalf of the applicant uh wilson properties group and as the chair noted um really satisfaction of condition nine of an originally issued special permit from 2018 which was extended in 2020 with me this evening the manager of wilson properties group pete wilson who some of you probably had met on site at the site visit yesterday. Um, I mean, oh wait, I'm sorry that uh, just remind before you jump into it. Uh, sure. Two two points I need to make here. Uh, number one, yes, we did have the site visit yesterday, and I want to bring up for uh, everybody what was talked about at that site visit. We toured the property. Um, we saw what the we were shown locations of roughly where the house would be as well as the property line and the driveway. Uh, we had asked about plans for what the driveway would be constructed of. We were informed it was going to be made of pavement. Um, we asked whether or not the house was going to be built in line uh, with some of the surrounding houses where uh, there would be views from windows into the other houses. Uh, we were told that it would be staggered enough that that wouldn't be the case. Um, I think those were the primary ones. I think we talked about, uh, again, the driveway, how it was going to be constructed um, at an angle to prevent water runoff. Was there any other questions that we had that were asked at the time? Uh, Ms. Marshall? We observed the wetlands um, 
delineation, or at least parts near the driveway, and I think also the rain garden area. Yep. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else that we missed from that? Uh, and then lastly, before we jump into this, uh, disclosures. Um, I want to see, does anybody else on the board have any disclosures on this matter? Uh, I have two disclosures to make. Uh, number one, I serve on the um, Board of Licensing Commission with Ma Mr. Uh, Gaston De Los Reyes, who is an abutter uh, to the property in question. And then secondly, I uh, rent a property from Mr. Adrian Fabos, who was the previous uh, owner of the property here in question. Uh, as I do not have any financial ties to uh, the current applicant, nor do I have any financial ties to Mr. De Los Reyes. I do believe that I will be able to remain impartial for this hearing. Uh, with that being said, does anybody else have any disclosures? Anything else we're missing procedurally before we jump into this, uh, Chris or Steve? Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I did. I was unable to be at the site visit because of prior commitments. Um, but I did visit the location. I didn't walk upon the property, but I observed the property. I'm familiar with that area. And so I wanted the, the applicant to know that I had um, familiarize myself with the area. Yeah, thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Yes, the uh, the site visit was attended by myself, Ms. Marshall, Ms. Parks, and Ms. Brestra. Um, go ahead, Ms. Marshall. Yeah, I don't I don't know if it's necessary to um, list the documents that were submitted for our review. Uh, do we have them all in, in 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 record, Chris, or do I need to go one by one with all the documents? They are listed on page. Three, no, four of the opening statement. Uh, the one you sent me most recently, because I, yeah. I didn't. Uh, well, it's it, it's right before the public. Sure. It's right before it says public hearing. Um, there's a letter. Do you want me to read them? Yeah, if you can go ahead. I don't sure. seem to see it on here. A letter dated January 3rd, 2023 from attorney Thomas R. Reedy presenting the request. Management plan form undated. Plans prepared by Berkshire Design Group dated March 18th, 2022, revised as of 1130, 2022. Um, sheet, well, I, I'll just say site plan, planting plan, rain garden details, site plan comparison, existing site plan. Then there was also a special permit decision, ZBA FY. 2018-03 to Adrian Fabos to create two flag lots. Special permit decision ZBA FY 2020-18 to Wilson Properties to allow extension of time to commence construction. And there were a few other things that came in recently. One was a um, images of the buildings, which I didn't list here because I created this statement before I got the images. So there they are elevations of the buildings from three directions. And we also received an email from Mary uh, Anderson, who is an abutter to the property. And she was commenting um, essentially that she wasn't going to be in favor of changes to the plan unless they weren't um, negatively impacting certain things. And I think you all have that email. Um, and I think that's it. I don't have that email. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Um, yes, I, I did not. Um, I looked at all my emails. I did not see that email. So that um, if I'm, if it's possible to get a copy, I would appreciate it. Yep, uh, Steve, would you be able to uh, help out Mr. O'Connor? Yeah, Chris, if you have that available to print, I can uh, deliver that to him. I think I might have sent it to you. And also share it just on screen, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Could you uh, restate which email that was, please? It's an email um, that I forwarded to the Zoning Board of Appeals members from Mary Anderson. I will provide that to Mr. O'Connor. Thank you. And then, um, 
All right, do we need anything else uh, procedurally or are we able to get into it now? I'll forward this to Steve right now and he can put it on the screen if he is able to do that. Here goes, Steve. I've got it, thank you, Chris. Are you gonna share your screen, Steve? Yes, I'm just trying to bring that up. Do you want me to read this, Mr. Maxfield? Uh, yeah, you can go for it. We might as well at this point. It's an email from Mary Anderson to Christine Brestrup dated today. Um, it says, hello, Christine, thank you for the Zoom link. I would like to let the zoning board know that I am opposed to any changes in the current plan for building on the proposed lot at the end of Canton Ave. If the plans include expanding, relocating, or otherwise creating further environmental damage to that area, Mary Anderson, 191 North Whitney Street. All right, thank you so much. Um, all right. So with that all out of the way, I think uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you, Mr. Reedy, and uh, let you go ahead and get started on the presentation. Perfect. Show time. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot again for the record. Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of Wilson Properties Group um, in satisfaction of condition nine. And so I think that's important because it's a pretty discreet matter that's in front of the board tonight. It is just uh, the responsibility of the property owner, Wilson Properties Group, to come before the board at a public hearing to review the home location and proposed screening plans. So if it's okay, I'd like to share my screen and just, I think I'll orient everybody to where we're talking about geographically and then show some plans and then hopefully have a productive discussion. All right, so just to, if everybody can see my screen, just to orient everyone to where we are, this is, uh, you know, Canton Ave runs north-south. This is the particular property that we're talking about right here. Um, a little bit of background, the Fables family owned this property, this property, and this property right here. Uh, in 2018, they got a special permit for two flag lots, being these two properties they subdivided the properties and then ultimately conveyed this one off to its current owner and conveyed these two off to Wilson Properties. Um, Wilson Properties came in front of the board in 2020 to get an extension. Uh, special permits um, can last up to three years. In Amherst, I believe it's two years. And so they came before the board to get an extension and an extension was granted. That uh, extension um, expires April 10th. So one of the things we may be doing this evening is requesting a further extension. I think, frankly, because of the um, hiccup with the posting, um, we're probably cutting it a little close for April 10th. Uh, the building permit application has been submitted, but I don't know if it will be reviewed, um, but it certainly won't be issued prior to uh, the special permit conditions being satisfied. So um, again, just backing up, this is the property that we're talking about, and it was uh, previously approved in 2018. So then I will go to another screen. Okay. And so now what I've got up is the plan. And so if you recall, you've got Canton Ave on the right side of the sheet running north-south, this is that parcel that we had um, talked about. So this is what the proposed plan looks like. You've got a driveway, and maybe one of the things I can do is I'll start with the overlay. So the red is the proposed plan. The underlying black uh, with the cross hatches is the approved plan. And so 
one of the things uh, for several different reasons, but one of the things that the landowner wanted to do was straighten out the driveway, add additional shoulders, add a fire truck turnaround, and then have an attached garage versus what was previously shown as a detached garage. Um, this plan has already been improve, uh, approved by the Conservation Commission. So the property owner went through a notice of intent, received an order of conditions for the plan that's currently in front of you. Um, I will note that one of those special conditions, special condition number nine, is that if runoff is documented coming off of this property during or after construction, the site will be considered out of compliance with the order of conditions. So if drainage would be a concern to the zoning board, that is already addressed in the order of condition. So uh, going back to the plan, you've got the underlaid, what was approved, a meandering road coming into a garage, a walkway, a turnaround um, within wetlands, and then the principal structure. What's being proposed is that straight driveway, turnaround here, driveway, garage, and structure. And so, and this will deal a little bit with the public meeting that's on for a little bit later as far as a deviation from the plans and requiring the board's approval at a public meeting, but that's really the whole picture. So then we'll go to the proposed plan for um, the house location. That house is proposed to be located in this area here, and I'll show some um, uh, renderings of the exterior. Uh, I believe it's 28.4 feet from the property line. Uh, based on my calculation on GIS, I believe the closest adjacent property house is at least 60 feet into that property. So you've got at least 100 feet between the properties and then uh, between the uh, structures on the properties. And then we've got 33 arborvitaes um, to be planted along that westerly property line. Um, five feet on center, I think three to four feet at planting, and those will reach 12 to 14 or 15 feet high when matured. Um, we would expect a condition that if any of those plantings failed, that they would have to be replaced within one growing season. And so this has been pretty well vetted by the Conservation Commission as far as the wetlands, the rain garden, the drainage, um, not being more detrimental to the wetlands than what was uh, previously approved, et cetera. And so we think, you know, somewhat discreetly in front of you, the location of the house as compared to what was approved is or should be acceptable. And then you've got those plantings, particularly around the westerly side, and then some plantings on the southerly side. But if if you recall, the houses uh, off Harvard Street, which is the closest cross street, are further towards the south. So, you know, I don't want to cut it too short, but if we're just talking about house location and, and screening, it's somewhat self-explanatory. Maybe I will one more thing, if I could. Um, let me show just a couple of the exterior renderings so you get a flavor of what the, the house will look like. Traditional New England gabled roof with dormers, uh, windows over a, a porch. So that's the front side. That's the east side. This is the back uh, or the west side of the property. And then you've got coming up from the south from the, uh, the driveway. So you'd be coming around and then coming into this um, southerly exterior. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Um, all right. So go to questions for the board. Um, first question I actually have, you, I'm sorry, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Reedy, a condition about runoff that was in here. Uh, where, where is that condition? Yeah, so that's in the order of conditions. So as I said, uh, Wilson Properties went through the Conservation Commission. They filed a notice of intent because they're going to do work within jurisdictional area. Conservation Commission issues an order of condition saying, that's fine. You can do the work within the jurisdictional area, but here's how you're going to do it. And so they have a whole list of conditions, special conditions, general conditions, um, 
for the work to be done on the site. And my point was that one of those conditions um, is if runoff is documented coming off of the property during or after construction, the site will be considered out of compliance with the order of conditions. So just in case there's any, because you know here, and this is probably more germane for the public meeting, but we're changing the driveway. We aren't changing the topography of the driveway. We're just changing uh, the width of it. And instead of going, instead of meandering, we're just coming straight. But again, this plan was approved by the commission and they have that condition. Um, and then as I think you've mentioned in your site walk, the driveway is going to be sloped appropriately so that runoff does not uh, occur into Cantonelle. Thank you. And then um, another question I have, it's uh, just a little bit, if you know the, the history of this property, to what degree you might know that. This is improved in 2018. Um, what, uh, what's what been the, the cause for the delay for uh, construction on this? And then what was ultimately, if you know, the, the reason to sell this property to uh, Wilson Properties, if, if you have any any insight into to that? Back yeah. Sure. Um, so the Wilson's, uh, Wilson Properties bought it in 2019. Um, so it was approved. I could tell you exactly when it was approved. Looks like January of 2018, and it wasn't transacted until 2019. Um, I can't tell you why. I, I frankly, Adrian was running the show for his his folks. I don't know why they didn't transact until. Um, whether there was lack of buyers, whether there was other things in the market. And then subsequently, um, you know, Wilson Properties bought it. I think they had some other things going on. <clears throat> so they got the extension in 2020. And then I think we all know what happened uh, shortly thereafter. And so, you know, world turned upside down. Um, and so that's why we're, we're here. And then obviously, uh, Wilson Properties had to go through the Conservation Commission. They wanted to get those approvals set before they came back before the board, because the uses, you know, the special permit issued for the flag lots. But if the design was going to change based upon conservation saying, oh, well, you can't do it there, you have to move it here, it didn't make much sense to waste the Zoning Board of Appeals time or anybody else's time. So they want to get the CONCOM set, they got that set. And then we had worked with Maureen end of last year, and then Maureen had left, and then end of December, beginning of January, I, you know, Rob stepped in, we sent it over to Rob, and then you know, here we are in front of you uh, for the satisfaction of that condition. So um, I don't think anything, but maybe some bad luck, bad timing. Um, but I think, you know, with this plan um, and, you know, Pete can tell us when he'll be ready to go, but they've filed for the building permit. So I would suspect that if this is approved, then they would be looking to start, you know, as soon as possible. Got it. And then um, this might be might be a question for, for town staff on this one, just because, so what we've got before us, it's just to uh, review condition nine, um, but we're being presented with kind of a different property layout than what had initially been approved. But I don't see any condition in the special permit uh, that I think we usually see and, and the way we typically approve special permits now, saying that it, it must be built uh, according to what was proposed. I'm seeing number four, final building plan shall be reviewed by the town engineer prior to receiving a building permit to ensure compliance of town engineering standards are still being satisfied. Uh, would we have to make um, specific finding rulings on the changes to the design of this or if you, if I may, Mr. Chair, if you look at condition 12, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I, and I agree, it's not our typical, you know, I'm in front of you guys enough. I think I know the typical conditions at this point, you know, to be constructed substantially in accordance with the plans dated, whatever they are here, we've got 12, which says the project shall be built to the approved plan date of November 7th, 2017. Any substantial deviation from this approved plan shall return to the ZBA for review at a public meeting. And so if you look at the agenda, the second mm -hmm. agenda item here this evening is the public meeting, which is just it, the, there it is. the horse of a different color to a certain extent. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Excellent. Um, 
All right, so those are, are most of my questions right now. Uh, other um, board members, do you have questions about this right now? If you do, please go ahead and, and raise your hand because the, uh, the share screen here is preventing me from seeing you if you're oh, doing it via camera. I can stop sharing if you want. I just don't know if people want to. <laughs> No, I think it'll be useful. To, it's, this is Sarah. I have my hand up. <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Marshall. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this may be of interest to the public. Could you talk, Mr. Wilson told us about this yesterday, but you could say for the record, um, the fire department's input on this driveway plan and the, and the turnaround. Um, and that, so that, and then just how this rain garden is going to help with runoff. We don't see the rain garden here, but. Um, so you should be able to see it on the plan that I have yeah. up currently. Um, so what you have here, so what was, and I'll go back to the overlay. So what was approved, I believe was 10 foot wide pavement with two foot shoulders. What's proposed and what was approved by the Conservation Commission is 12 foot pavement with uh, four foot shoulders on either side. So that gives better ability for uh, emergency vehicles to access the property. The uh, initial design as you see under here did not have a, a turnaround for a fire truck. Um, this has that, I mean, it's got a hammerhead where you'd come up, fire truck could pull in here, back up here and then do that three point turn and, and exit uh, the site. And then to get to the rain garden. Wait, can I, can I just say something before you move on? So the shoulders and this turnaround, as I understand it, are gravel. So that's Correct. not, all, are not, not all pavement. pavement. Correct. Okay. They do count towards lot coverage because that's the way the bylaw is written. Mm -hmm. But you know, for practical purposes, rain falls, it's gonna find its way through those, through the gravel versus you know, something that's uh, truly impervious. Right, and you said the driveway will be sloped to the north toward the wetland, yes? Correct, slightly, I would say. So it doesn't have yeah. to be yeah. much for the water yeah. to run, right. but, but that's the way that, yeah, the water is not in, it's again, towards that condition number, or it might be nine of the order of conditions, not to run off site. And that, that means also, you know, not just traveling east along the road, uh, it also means you know, traveling in any other direction. So southerly is right. is one of those other directions. So we would slope, we'll slope um, slightly the driveway to the north. Thank you. Sure. Uh, questions from other board members? Uh, Mr. Meadows. I have two uh, things. One is that the uh, that the turnaround be the condition be that the turnaround of the fire truck be not used at all for parking. Um, and the second is that the arborvitae are not pollinators. I'm wondering if we can get those changed to something that are pollinators. Like holly, if I could guess. Can you guess that? <laughs> so surprised. <laughs> Yeah, Pete, if you're on, I don't know if, um, you know, what you think about changing those uh, arborvitaes to hollies. I mean, it's, it provides arguably the same amount of screening. They'll, I think they're native to the area and obviously are pollinators as well. They are slower growing though. They are slower growers. Yeah. Hi, good evening to everyone. Um, yeah, we'd be open to meeting the screening conditions. Um, and if I could just back up on the driveway. So uh, I don't know what particular fire department standard was for the driveway in 17, but here in 22, that, that's why the driveway has been modified as well. And um, we also modified it for any ambulance need because they're typically a larger vehicle, uh, not as heavy, but, and maybe not, and not as long, but, um, and, and the last thing is, yeah, the turnaround would be designated, um, for for uh, just that to turn around, there's parking uh, up there at the house uh, and in the garage. So I think, Mr. Meadows, the answer is yes. Uh, if the board would prefer holly, then holly would be planted. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, Ms. Prestrup? Yeah, I just had a couple of things. Um, one is I, I don't think, and I would uh, defer to Mr. Mara or Mr. Reedy on this, but I don't think, because this isn't a new special permit, I don't think we can um, impose conditions on it. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is I wonder, Arborvitae, whether you like them or not, are very good screening plants. And I wonder if Mr. Meadows would um, accept, um, in addition to Arborvitae, putting some pollinator plants here on the property, rather than taking away the Arborvitae, which are <clears throat> screening plants that grow very quickly. So I guess that's my suggestion is to add some pollinator plants here rather than taking the Arborvitae away, because I think that that would really change the screening to the west. I, I, I think it's a good idea. I, I'm not certain Arborvitae over time start dying off and don't look good and don't provide screening. Holly over time will go grow much slower, but retain their uh, foliage um, a lot longer than the Arborvitae will. So it's a matter of thinking short-term or long-term. Then uh, I do believe in these cases that we've done in the past, if it's, uh, there's a question of whether or not the board can impose conditions, uh, I believe it has been if the applicant is open to uh, new conditions being imposed, then that's certainly we're certainly able to do it. So what I'm hearing so far is the applicant is uh, is amenable to some of the conditions that we're talking about. And uh, if if we if we come to one that the applicant is not all right with, we can uh, we can deal with it then. But um, I think we can, might be able to do something with Holly versus uh, Arborvitaes on that one. Uh, questions for uh, other members, Miss Marshall. Um. Yeah, is this the first time a screening plan has been presented? I believe so. I did not represent uh, Fabos when they went through this process initially, but um, I don't believe a, a landscape plan or planting plan necessarily was presented. Yeah, I'm just concerned that that there's, I don't know, if there had been the previous plan and abutters were okay with it and now something different is proposed that, so. Yeah, and I don't know if there's a way to, you know, split the baby, but if, you know, Arborvitae here, Holly down here or something like that, you know, the lower, the southerly half, we, we do Holly from here to let's say, you know, mid driveway or something like that. And then Arborvitae for the other piece, just understanding that this this is where the windows are, um, the 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 life, the more activity, and then down here the holly, and so maybe it's a way to get a little bit of both. But you know, we're amenable. Uh, Mr. Other Chairman, go ahead. Is that, is I'm that Vince O'Connor. Mr. O'Connor, go ahead. Yeah, so I have um, I, I have a question about is this uh, is the proposed um, residential unit be is going to be marketed for uh, single family home use or as a rental? I it think, it, yeah, I mean, at, at, frankly, I don't know that it matters to the board. I don't know that um, Wilson Properties knows what they're going to do. It probably is going to be market dependent, right? If they can find a, a buyer who is head over heels for this site, um, and then if that buyer buys it and wants to rent it, so you know, it's um, frankly, I don't know that that's within the the purview of the board. With all due respect, yeah, it, it affects some of the concerns I have about conditions. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, uh, so I just. Um, and I, I also have a question about, um, the screening in the previous plan, there was no screening or didn't appear to be any screening necessary to the South, but as the vehicles exit the, um, 
the the driveway uh, to the to the south. Um, do you plan? I noticed that at the site visit, a couple of trees were going to be removed. Uh, is there going to be some screening to the south with regard both to the lights that are uh, motion activated that are on the that are on the garage that face south? And also the issue of the of vehicles exiting the garage um, directly to the south, uh, toward uh, the, ad the adjacent property to the south, um, is again the the previous iteration of the site plan uh, because the garage was going to essentially be right at the end of the driveway. Uh, didn't need screening. Now, the, no, I think that issue is, is there, what are your thoughts about the screening to the south and, and both screening the lights, the motion lights and the uh, exiting vehicles? I think it's a great point, Mr. O'Connor. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the changes in the plan from what was approved to what is being proposed. And there is screening proposed um, along that southerly end of the driveway where, you know, if vehicles as they exit, that's, you know, that's the way they'll be facing. They'll be facing south and then they'll be turning east and traveling east. So there's some um, dogwoods and some viburnum in this area um, at the southerly end of that driveway. Okay. Yeah, the, the the plans that I have just don't show that area. That's why I asked the question. Um, and with respect to the the exterior lighting, um, I I just would recommend um, uh, that there be. Um, that the that the actual what was would have been referred to in the in the past as a light bulb or the LED lights um, that the the actual um, device that lights that the cast light on the driveway and so forth and the, the surroundings um, not be visible from adjoining properties. Um, I've seen a lot of cut off things that that essentially cut at the horizontal level. And if if a house is below that level, then essentially some of those 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 um, those lighting fixtures, which are not which don't shield the um, the LED or the bulb from adjoining properties. Um, essentially, those adjoining properties get to see the light bulbs in their in their second floor. In some cases, in their second floor windows, and I'm I am concerned that um, that notwithstanding the general language of the of the condition, that that the that the uh, devices, the lighting devices, be cut off in such a way as that no one from the adjoining property can see the device that casts the light. Um, so it's, I don't know how how to make that specific, but I, I would definitely recommend it, especially, um, it, it won't make any difference whether this is a rental or a, a single family home, a prop, you know, use, um, but it would, uh, I think, uh, keep the peace with the neighbors if they don't have to look at these lights, because I've seen a lot of so-called cutoff lighting that is extremely visible to both the residents, in some cases of multifamily housing, and adjoining neighbors. And I don't think that's a, a neighborly thing to have happen. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Um, and I just have one other question about, about um, 
Uh, this is a slightly different world than existed in 2017. Um, and I have two, two concerns with regard to that would have been, if, if this were initially presented now, would have been concerned. One is whether the garage area is going to be provided with a, an electric vehicle charging station, um, which I think uh, if you consult uh, 10 point, I think 384, the life of this building is such that uh, that that will come into play in terms of electric vehicle charging. The other question I have um, for the applicants is whether they have any thought, given that the time to do things least expensively is during the initial construction, is whether they plan to install on the west facing roof or in some place around the building, um, either rooftop solar or heat pumps to essentially bring this building as close to zero carbon emissions operationally as, as the site will allow. Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Um... And just before we uh, before you go ahead and answer those questions, I just want to make sure that we are all on the same page here with this. It's just what's before us tonight um, is going to be reviewing of condition nine uh, about the screening. And then because there's been a pretty substantial change to the layout of the building here, it is going to be condition 12. So any uh, I don't think we're going to be necessarily imposing new conditions but we can certainly have a threshold that we uh, believe we need to have met by the applicant in order to satisfy conditions nine and conditions 12. Um, so just wanna make sure as we, we continue on with the, uh, this meeting tonight that we keep that in mind. Um, so I certainly think it's, it's a, a fair question to ask uh, whether or not uh, there has been any thought given to uh, to electric vehicle charging uh, in that garage, uh, Mr. Reedy. Uh, I'll I'll ask Pete. I mean, I don't think it would be required. I know some projects under code require, if not a full construction of the EV, but at least the designation of a space for the EV. Um, you know, obviously with the gas moratorium, with other considerations, it's going to be an all electric house. So I would assume. Um, uh, heat pumps, you know, air source heat pumps are going to be used here. Um, to touch on the lighting just quickly, there is a condition, condition seven lighting plan submitted with each building permit indicate that all lights are facing downward and dark sky compliant. And you know, I, I would be a little hesitant to give a butters uh, unilateral control over if there is anything visible, then you know, there would be a violation of the permit. So I think as written, I mean, it was thoughtful and as written, you know, I think that they also want to be good neighbors as well. So I think Mr. O'Connor's point is, is noted. So Pete, I don't know if you've got an idea on EV um, and or solar slash uh, ground source or air source heat pumps. Yes, okay, so if we take the uh, the issue of the charging vehicle, it is now part of the code, so there will be a charging um, station there in one of the garage bays. Um, there is there is something, and I haven't flushed this out with the building department, there is some uh, solar prep that I think the town of Amherst is requiring. We would comply with that, but at this time, we don't have any definitive plans regarding solar. Um, the other thing to bring to mention is the lighting would be downcast. It would be on a timer. Uh, the timer minimum, I think, is uh, a minute, and then you can go in increments of three, five, and up. But to keep in mind, the closest house um, to this proposed house and garage, the closest house to the garage is going to be a minimum of 200 feet, a minimum, and directly south off the driveway that uh, is Mrs. Hart's house. I believe she lives in it. 
and she has uh, she has some kind of evergreens up there already existing. And that southerly line, although we're going to infill, as uh, Mr. Reedy mentioned, there is some natural um, screening there as soon as spring kind of, you know, as soon as May gets around here. So I just wanted to point that out. We, we are not physically close to any house. Um, and although this isn't maybe a big issue, the other thing to mention uh, that Mr. O'Connor raised is um, Mrs. Hart rents out that, that uh, rent, ranch, ranch house to the south of our driveway um, to the corner of the neighboring street and, and Gaston across the street, that's a two family. And I believe he lives in one side, rents the other. So um, just to give you a little more background to the neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Um, I think I saw Miss Marshall, your hand is up. Uh, if you're there, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. So regarding the relocated, somewhat relocated house, could the applicant tell us about the change in the footprint? I don't know if it's larger overall or smaller. Also, it looks to me like it may have moved a little bit away from the wetland buffer. Is that is that the case? Yes, let me pull up the screen. So this is probably the best way to see it um, without having the footprint calculations, you know, just by eye. When I look at the size of this right here and I look at the size of this right here, they are larger than certainly these combined. And in fact, you know, the new house plus the new garage may be able to fit into or very closely fit into where, what that house was. So, um, you know, I think as far as building coverage, I think we are down a couple of percentage points um, from what was there previously. And then when you look at, you know, you've got the wetlands here, you see that there's that intrusion on the wetlands here. You see the proposed in the red staying outside of that wetland edge right there. So there's not that fill of wetland as it was going to be before. But so also think, the house, also the house is further. I thought there was- Oh yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. I just, yeah, yeah practically Sorry. speaking, you've got that distance and now you've got this distance. Mm -hmm. uh, other questions from board members or are we good to open it up to the public? All right. Uh, in that case, we will go ahead and open up for public comment. Uh, for public comment, if you would like to, you can go ahead and uh, use the raise hand function on Zoom. If you're calling in, go ahead and press star nine. Uh, we'll go ahead. I'll call on you. Uh, we'll go ahead and promote you so you'll be able to talk. Once we've done so, please unmute yourself and then list your name and address for the record. Then you'll have three minutes to make your comment and please address your comments directly to the board and not to the applicant. Uh, with that in mind, we've got, I see Myra Ross with their hand up. You can go ahead and promote Myra Ross. Myra, you should be able to speak. Do you All right. Me? We can hear you. Uh, Ms. Ross, if you want to go ahead, state your uh, okay. name and address for the record. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Just stop. All right, um, now can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so I have a couple questions. I, uh, Myra Ross, I live at 34 Harvard Avenue. So I'm up the hill on the corner of North Whitney, um, corner of Harvard and North Whitney, on this side of North Whitney, on, on the, the project side of North Whitney. Next door to me is Carolyn Hart's house. And then further down the hill is the ranch house that Mr. O'Connor referred to. Um, I am very concerned and was for the original proposal about water. The water table is very high here. I fortunately am located uphill from the site. Our driveway, I mean, our property slopes down to Carolyn Hart's house. I believe they have a sump pump in their basement. One time when it was broken, and when I was walking down the street in April, they had a hose coming from the house out onto Harvard Avenue. And the amount of water that was coming out of that basement for quite a few hours was really frightening. 
Um, the water table is very, very high already. And it appears to me that you're going to take out some trees in order to move this driveway further to the south. The trees absorb water without them. I believe there will be much more serious water problems that are not taken care of by the driveway runoff to the north because we're talking about what's to the south of the driveway. And so I'm, I'm very, very concerned about the trees removal, if I have that correct. And then I have a question, which is um, the proposal is for two flag lots, but there seems to only be one house. So if somebody could answer that, and and really, um, I hope the I hope that the ZBA will really think very hard about the removal of those trees and asking them to relocate the driveway um, again, because the trees have to stay there, or the water in those houses on Harvard, not mine, because I'm uphill from it but the water on those houses on Harvard will be extremely problematic. And this is David Meyer's husband. We, we're on the same camera or, or microphone. So I'll just throw in my thoughts now. And, and they're very similar. I, I, I share the same concerns. Uh, it looks to me as if the original design of the driveway took into account leaving the trees because it was further from the border. Whereas I see that the new lines of the driveway bring it very close to the border and probably is what's requiring the removal of those trees. The other two thoughts were fairly minor, but one has to do with um, the garage lights. I think Vince is absolutely right. We have garage lights and they go on all the time because there's so many animals in this area. They're constantly traipsing back and forth and turning on the lights. So for the neighbor's uh, consideration, Vince's point is well taken. And the only other thing I wanted to add was um, my concern that the special permit conditions that you're considering use the word substantial as opposed to your traditional language. And I'm not sure why the board should move from its traditional requirements to do something different in this case. Thank you. Oh, and regarding the water, if they build in the fall, they're not going to likely violate the water conditions, but if they build in a rainier season, they're more likely to. So I, I sort of have a little bit of issue with the question about um, during building or shortly after construction, if there's a problem, it will be in non-compliance. Um, I think you need to anticipate that there are going to be serious water issues when there is water, and that you know when they build it doesn't really matter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reedy. Do you want sure. to uh, collect all public comment first, or would you like to respond uh, one by one? Probably one by one will be the, the simplest way to do it. Um, so I think first, and as you had noted, Mr. Chair, for clarity, um, the special permit was issued for essentially the creation of one main lot, which is now owned, uh, which is a, a across the street, and I believe it's number 43-45, uh, and two flag lots. And so what one of the conditions of that originally issued special permit as extended in 2020 was that the property owner had to come back to discuss screening and home location. And so that's what we're doing. We're not asking for a new special permit. We're not asking for any modification of an existing special permit. Uh, we're just asking, we're, we're really just looking to satisfy that condition. And so that's why we're only dealing with this one flag lot out of Oh, the three lots that were created is because this is the only one that we're dealing with at this point. So that's the first point, which I think is important. Um, the second point, I think the the comments are good. Pete's on, he's listening. It's at his risk, I'm sure. I mean, he's built houses before. He understands the way water works, which is frankly relatively consistent. Um, when I look at the, and I'll share my screen again, um, with the property viewer, with the topographical maps from the town. So you've got, you know, this is that property um, at the corner, 40 Canton, and then this one's 46 Harvard. When you look, you've got elevation 290 right here, 295 right here. You know, if we're looking at it, the house is probably going to be somewhere in this area between 305 and 310 as, you know, top of foundation, if you've got an eight foot foundation, maybe, you know, footings underneath it, you might be at, let's say, 
295, 300. And I don't know that you're, as far as the house goes, displacing like hydrogeologically um, a, a bit of water. The water's still going to find its way. And I don't think you're putting, you know, you got a cup and you put a, a coin in there, you're not all of a sudden making that water overflow. And I think as far as, um, let me get the comparison plan back up. I'm sure there's a better way to do it besides switching off, but I'm not smart enough to know how to do it yet. Um, in really either instance, you know, these trees are, are, whether it was the older version or this newer version, these trees are likely to come down because of the disruption from um, the gravel base and then the finishing of the driveway. And so I don't know between approved and proposed that there's um, much, if any, of a, a difference between maintaining uh, trees. If anything, this jog has to do with these wetlands over here, right? So you see the wetlands coming out here, the jog here. This is why we went through the Conservation Commission first uh, to allow the existence of the driveway in this location. Mr. Reedy, um, I see we have uh, Mary Anderson. Uh, go ahead, we can get them in. Hi, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, Please go ahead, state your name and address for the record. Oh yeah, Mary Anderson. I own the uh, property at 191 North Whitney Street that abuts the whole northern side of, of the big piece of property. Anyway, um, yeah, so my first question regards the uh, screening plants. So how tall are these plants going to be when they're first put in? When they're first planted, how, how, I need to know how tall they're uh, going to be and how long it will take them to become tall enough to do what you want it to do. Uh, Ms. Anderson, uh, it's, it's please uh, address the concerns to the board. Uh, okay. I so, am. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't have that answer. Uh, so, Mr. Reedy, I suppose you could give that to me. I'd be happy to. Uh, three to four feet uh, at planting, I believe. And and arborvitaes are, as I think most folks know, pretty quick growers. I can't obviously, I can't tell you how long it takes to get to twelve to to fourteen feet. Um, and one of the other things, if you know, while I've got this. Um, this is the pro this is subject property. I believe this is Mrs. Anderson's property yes. up here. Right. And so then it's you know, she abuts really this bigger one, which isn't the subject of the the hearing this evening. But I would expect, you know, for those arbs on the side, you know, they probably reach that. Oh I'm not even going to take a guess, but they're they're relatively quick growers. Oh, okay. But if the point of these plants is to screen the view and protect from light and so on, then shouldn't they be larger to start with when they go in? I mean, four feet, that's not even halfway up the first floor. And you're anticipating a, a two-story building, which means the second story is gonna be, what, 15 feet high? Do arborvitae even grow that high? So that's one question. And then the second question would be, will they be planted before the construction begins so that at least there'll be some sound abatement and a little bit of vision abatement or will all of that work be done afterwards which will I, I mean it makes it kind of useless for the first several years nice thought but it isn't going to help the neighbors any for the first several years so that's one point um the second thing was um is there going to be any restriction on future tree cutting in that lot because it's the, the lack of trees, as were alluded to by the previous speakers, that really exacerbate the whole water problem. And uh, I don't know if the town can impose or at least request that before the landowner, whoever that may be, cuts any trees, they come before the conservation just to, just to consider the impact cutting some of those trees might have on future water problems. That was the second thing. Shoot, I had a third one. Well, I can't remember it, so I guess that's my uh, that's my problem. Yeah, I'm I'm also concerned about the water only on behalf of the people that are there, and I know water has been a problem for all the years I've lived. You know, I'm 76 years old, and I 
lived there forever. And I know that piece of property quite well. And I know that water has been a continuing problem there. So I think it would be very good to have a lot of attention played, uh, paid to that property, regardless of who owns it or when they own it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Um, so yeah, go ahead, uh, Mr. Reedy. Thanks a lot. Uh, so maybe the second one first, there is a condition in the order of conditions underlined uh, condition number three of the special conditions where no vegetation removal is permitted outside of the limit of work line. So they put that and then there's obviously jurisdictional issues as well. Um, you know, anything within 100 feet of a resource area is subject to Conservation Commission jurisdiction. So there's that condition in there. And Pete, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna turn to you on the ARB. So what I'll say is typically uh, plantings are done subsequent to the construction, and it's kind of the final landscaping is kind of the final thing that is done. Pete, for this, I don't know if there if it if it makes sense or if the the ARBs would be in danger um, if you were to plant them first, uh, or what your thinking is as far as the sequencing of construction with the the arborvitaes and potentially the holly as well. Okay, uh, I'm glad to answer those good questions. So let's start first. I know everyone and water came up. Uh, Mrs. Anderson mentioned uh, water back through the conservation hearing. I don't know about the Roths. Um, so basically we did a test hole out there last summer uh, and we went down three feet deep in trying to ascertain what kind of subsoil we had. I mentioned this to the board members that were at the site visit Yes, uh, when, Wednesday morning. So we found no water at three feet, no sign of water, no modeling, no staining. We found about nine to 10 inches of topsoil and the rest was gravel. Um, water, as I said, came up to, and it seems like a, a good question to, to thoroughly kind of answer. And maybe um, others will remember me sharing this information at the conservation hearing. So according to the neighbor, Gaston, he's not had any water off of that lot affecting him, not ever since he's been there. And he's been there since 20. I've talked to him at length last summer. Um, I mentioned we had a little microburst last August where the area just was doused with water. I went up there physically, took some pictures, spent a couple hours just watching to see if there's any runoff, uh, which there wasn't. Um, so based on some actual digging, uh, we find no water conditions there. Um, the other problem is, is, as I mentioned to the board members yesterday, we have the property from properties from North Whitney, whose homes front on North Whitney, driveways come off of North Whitney, their backyards, which is considerable length, flow towards us easterly. Um, so we absorb water onto that parcel from them. It stays on the parcel as best I can see because the folks to the south, and this would affect Mrs. Hart's two properties, there's a natural little swale where the driveway is, um, where the south line where there is some trees uh, and natural screening there, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's more of a little berm. So water from our property can't even get over that um, and into either of Mrs. Hart's properties. So I, I'm trying to say to you, we were very comfortable with the conservation putting in that requirement that all water stay on the parcel because water is for all intents and purposes staying within that parcel now. The town of Amherst, I talked with the engineer and I talked with DPW folks, no one's had any complaint up there where the town has had to come out and say, hey, we need to put a, 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 some kind of a drainage in here. We need to put a catch basin for a storm drain. None of that exists. So. Um, I've heard Mrs. Hart talk about that ranch and water coming into that cellar. But the other problem is that ranch house is at a much lower elevation. There could be groundwater to the south. There could be a natural spring in the vicinity of that house. There could be several other factors which don't transfer up to our property, but may be conditions at that property. So hopefully I've addressed some general questions about the water. The next thing is back to the plantings. As I told the board members, uh, our property to the west continues to uh, go up in elevation. So I don't have in front of me the elevation where the row of arborvitaes or hollies would be planted. 
but that is going to be a, a probably a uh, maybe as much as a foot and a half higher uh, than the elevation at the driveway. Uh, so it will add a little bit of height to these initial bushes, as Mr. Reedy mentioned. And I think that's uh, the questions that I can address. Maybe Pete, time, just the timing of planting those arborvitaes. If you were going to wait, you know, traditionally until after everything else is done, because uh, it seems like so I've got the grading plan up. If you're looking at your screen and and you've got, you know, elevation one twelve, probably one fourteen up here. So I don't know if you have to grade that out and then put the arborvitaes in, which you know I don't think is an issue, but just um, to come full circle on that. Okay, so the procedure would be we would not want to start site construction if we had a very wet spring. Uh, it's just it's just a waste of time because uh, it's nothing but a headache to work in. So we would look for late spring, early summer. If the spring continues to be drier, we would, as soon as uh, we're through all the permitting process, would would try to get underway. Um, we would want to do all the site work. That means um, get the foundation in and backfilled. And once it's backfilled, because our intent is to get the lawn area in um, as, as quick as we can and work around that, we could put the shrubbery in uh, probably, uh, again, depending on when the site work's done, the foundation's in backfilled, all that grading work is done, which we want to get done before we even put lumber to the foundation. It, possibly if we start in June time period, um, we could be midsummer, maybe end of summer. If we can start more towards middle of April, uh, first part of May, depending on weather conditions, permitting, you know, it could be a little earlier, but either way, we're looking at summer conditions uh, and we would probably say, maybe it's better to wait till fall, a little cooler to put those plants in. So that's the best kind of uh, information we can share. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Um, all right, I'm seeing uh, Mr. Uh, Gaston de los Reyes' his hand up. Um, let's get Good him evening. in here. Go ahead. Yes, uh, th th thank you. So um, uh, I want to start please, actually uh, with a- Just please state your, uh, your name. Oh yeah, uh, Gaston, Gaston de los Reyes. I live at 45 Canton Ave across the street from the lot in question. I live in, in the Fabos house. Um, uh, and I want to start by uh, addressing the, the water issue, which, which just came up. It's, it's correct that I discussed with Wilson Construction that um, in 22, 2022, we didn't have any water issues, but I did um, tell uh, uh, Wilson Construction that we had water issues after they uh, did all the cutting on the land without, that didn't follow the conservation conditions. Um, and, and, and a side note here, I'm, I'm surprised, um, uh, Mr. Chair, that in response to your question about why it took so long to uh, get back here today, that, that uh, Mr. Reedy didn't mention the, uh, the, the issue with the unauthorized cutting and, and uh, movement of land that Wilson Construction did and, and the enforcement action that, that resulted. I, I, I had understood that that was part of the, the issue here. So, this is all to say that one of my concern, my, my real concern is the, um, the reliability of Wilson construction in, in adhering to the plans and to the commitments. And I uh, have had a you know, cordial and pleasant relationship with, with Pete and Harry Wilson, and I, I'm, I look forward to doing so. Um, uh, but my, my training and my experience is as a business ethicist. And so I'm you know, very familiar with the ways that businesses um, have a tendency to cut corners, and um, and, and I'm afraid that uh, some of that has has occurred in um, in in connection with these lots. Um, I am familiar with the lots because I my family moved to Amherst in 2018 with the intention to buy the lot in question. It was shortly after we made the decision to move that the that the home came up for sale, and we 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 purchased that already excited to live at the end of Canton Avenue. Um, and so we were very well informed about uh, the, the conservation issues in question. And so I was surprised that Wilson Construction 
said that they didn't know about the details about which trees they couldn't couldn't cut. I was uh, surprised at our last hearing together uh, with the ZBA at the end of 19 um, that the reason why Wilson Construction uh, moved to not have to do a public hearing tonight, to not have to notify abutters, was that Wilson Construction said that it was a clerk in the town hall that suggested that that would be a way to avoid the a couple of hundred bucks needed to spend on the newspaper ad. And so these are um, these are episodes that diminish rather than increase my my confidence in the business. Again, I'm talking about the business. I'm not talking about Pete Wilson. Um, I'm talking about Wilson Construction, a, a business that purchased the land to make money off of it. And uh, businesses, as you well know, uh, often try to increase the money and, and increase their flexibility to achieve their business goals by avoiding regulation. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm concerned uh, about those issues. And I also want to highlight to the ZBA that one of the considerations that the Conservation Commission gave a lot of weight to had nothing to do with the expertise of the Conservation Commission. The Conservation Commission explicitly um, noted that they were very concerned about not uh, uh, approving um, the, the, the plan to move forward because of the threat of litigation against the town um, based on a claim of a constitutional taking. Now, I, I think that that um, notion of a threat of litigation on that grounds is, is misguided, but that's a legal question. And the point is that the Conservation Commission is not, uh, does not have expertise uh, about litigation risk, and in my view, was well outside of its ken in uh, giving weight to that as a reason why um, they uh, agreed to uh, make changes as as they did. So uh, I am all in favor of a home going up there, but I'm not. I know nothing about what will lead uh, this construction to uh, cause water issues. I'm just ignorant about that. Um, uh, I, I, I will note Mr. Reedy said uh, earlier this evening that um, it's at Wilson Construction's risk if water issues result. And I, I don't, I, I guess I, I'm interested in understanding better what, what that risk is. I understand that if there's some uh, drainage issues during the course of construction, then they're out of compliance. I don't know who's enforcing that. I don't know what out of compliance means, but after the house is up, if there's further water issues, once uh, the Wilson, Wilson Construction doesn't own the, the property anymore, I'm, I guess I'm curious what it means to say that it's at their risk that water issues would result. And I finally want to remind the, 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 the ZBA that uh, we're, we're in the era of uh, climate weirdness when uh, water issues are, are um, you know, not what we used to have and uh, are existing uh, regulations were drawn up for an era that we don't live in anymore. And so with that, I, I, I want to um, conclude my remarks, but a key point to stress is that uh, I, I told Wilson Construction that we did have water issues after they did all of that cutting, that they seem to have subsided um, in uh, the, the year thereafter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. De Los Reyes. Go ahead, Mr. Reedy. Yeah, that's a, a tough one to respond to. There wasn't, I mean, I, I, I respect Mr. De Los Reyes and I, I didn't mean to uh, freeze over the fact that yes, there was cutting, there was an enforcement order. The Wilsons had to go in front of the Conservation Commission, uh, resulted in revised plans. Um, frankly, they handled most of that themselves. Um, I suspect that getting through the Conservation Commission, which was my ultimate point, was was the reason why this was prolonged. But I, I don't want to hide the ball here. Um, I think as far as uh, relative to the comment about at, at their risk, and I think uh, Mr. De Los Reyes brings up a good point, it would be at their risk during construction, obviously, and then for as long as they own the property. Uh, the condition is during or after construction. And so what I would see as the most like anything, right, and I'll be back in front of you in a certain number of weeks with another project and we'll have the same conversation and it's it's construction logistics, right, it's how do you manage it when there's disturbance on the site and that's the key because once you get the site stabilized, that's where things should be predictable and so 
when I mentioned at, at their risk, I mean, Pete and Harry, they, they're builders. They know how to control, or I think they know how to control the water, especially with um, the right uh, erosion and sediment control, understanding time of year, like Pete had said, doing it during a drier season. And so their risk would be if there is runoff, and then uh, any neighbor calls and, and Aaron Jock, the conservation agent, or Rob Moore, or one of his inspectors comes out and finds it, all of that money and time they've put into, the Wilsons have put into getting to that point, could be gone because there would be an enforcement order to either come into compliance or to just pull the permit away. And, and I wasn't involved in any constitutional taking arguments um, probably a tough argument to, to make, you know, for anybody. So, you know, to the, I know there's a lot of talk about drainage and water, et cetera, but I think as far as the business ethics uh, representations, and then just what we meant by risk, I think that would be our response. Yeah, if I could jump in and respond as well. Go ahead. Um, so we have had a, a cordial relationship with, with uh, Mr. I don't see his name up, but I'm going to just use Gaston because I will butcher his last name. No, Gaston is fine, Pete. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, so we did, we did have, and I apologize if I mischaracterized any of the water issue off of our property, but I did go over it with Gaston in 22. I was up there that afternoon. I think he may have come out. My memory is not that perfect. Uh, again, speaking of August of 2022, now, his driveway slopes downward off of Canton, the east side. He does have a little bit of berm built right up at the end of his driveway where it intersects with Canton Avenue. But that berm only extends so far. He never indicated to me, and Gaston, correct me where I go wrong, that the water ever went over the berm. It was more further south where the berm stops, and then it could meander its way onto the sidewalk south side sidewalk um but you know he's lived there and as he said not putting words in his mouth um he hasn't had a constant water issue i would i would state because otherwise he might call the town out and the town would have a record of saying hey we have a chronic issue with water so that's what i'd like to address because the site is is good otherwise uh, i know there's always concern about water but everything with the grading that exists there now and in the future will keep keep it on the property to the north side. That's part of what the rain garden does. Um, as to kind of clear the air on a subject that isn't really the topic tonight, but to the cutting. We buy the property, we see kids out there. It was our mistake. We, um, we did not, from Mr. Fabos, he told us there was no wetland on that smaller parcel where we were working. And we mitigated some liability with these widow makers out there it is unfortunate, you know, my, both my brother and I could save ourselves a lot of time and heartache over that. But the truth is, based on what Mr. Fabos told us, because we didn't get plans, that again was on us, I actually called Aaron and said we wanted to look at the lot with the potential to renew the original permit. So I physically called her, paid the fee, she came out, and that's how the whole thing started. If my brother and I had ever felt we were doing something we shouldn't have, I would never have asked her to come out. I certainly wouldn't have paid the $50 and say, let's come out and talk about this. Uh, so clearly, again, not pushing the blame anywhere, but to just air this out so it's in the in the open, you know, that, that was on us. We made that mistake. Um, so back to Gaston's comment about the original extension. My brother and I requested the original extension. Maureen was the liaison to the ZBA. She is the one that told me that this was what I could do. And yes, there was a fee savings in it. I apologize if I cut coupons, but that was her advice to me. I went with it just like tonight. You know, we'll work with the board to make sure they're happy and satisfied. But I didn't do it of my of my own intention, she guided me that way, just again, to clear the air, um, so there's no issue. 
<laughs> if I may, I, I uh, board to the ZBA. If I if I can address you, I I um, I uh, I feel I feel good about um, um, Mr. Wilson's comments, and um, and I um, you know I'm I, I feel the air is cleared from from my standpoint. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you both. All right. Um, do we have? Not seeing any new hands raised. Um, right now so we've got uh i guess we got a couple options ahead of us right now uh if we think we have enough information to move forward we could close the uh public hearing um or i believe we also have the option to leave it open and open the public meeting am i correct correct about that uh chris procedurally we can do that Mr. Chair, um, uh, I will leave it to your ahead. discretion whether or not to recognize any speakers, but I will say from a technical standpoint, I believe Ms. Anderson and Ms. Ross have been uh, re-raised their hands after um, after their comments. I don't think they were left up earlier. I see uh, Ms. Ross is down. If uh, Ms. Anderson or Ms. Ross, uh, I think we, yeah, we have time for um, some more public comments. If you guys like to go again, I'll start with uh, Ms. Ross. Just Hello. Um, I just want to say two sentences. One, there was a drought in 2022 of some um, significance. So if they're basing water issues on 2022, that's a good time to base water issues on if you want to build in a place where there's a water problem. And my other comment, and I guess it's a procedural comment for the town, is this, uh, we were never informed about Conservation Commission dealing with this topic at all. So I don't know how some people knew and some people didn't, but I wondered before uh, Mr. De Los Reyes's comments, I wondered why they approved this um, with all of the water issues. And now it looks sort of clear that there is a reason that might not have to do with water. And so it's a little perturbing. And I, I just wanna make sure that, that uh, that, that the water is central here because it is, you know, it's nice to say there might be a spring under the Hart's house and there might be, but then again, it might get a whole lot worse. So I just think it's important for you to think water, especially if the Conservation Commission didn't. That's it, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reed. I think I'll simply respond that the Conservation Commission did uh, consider the water. Yeah. All right, and then we'll go ahead to uh, Ms. Can Anderson. I jump in a minute? Oh yeah, sure, go right ahead. I, I apologize, Mr. Reedy too. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the, general, the general situation with soil is this, if you have wa a water table, there are several other methods to determine that you have an existing water table. If it is chronic as, Miss Ross mentioned, you end up with a modeling or staining of the soil. It kind of gives you a line where that soil has continues to have water because year after year after year, there is some iron in the soil and that creates what we call modeling or staining. Because I install and do a lot of excavating work, these are, these are tools we use, uh, boards of health use it with septic systems um, when we deal with install installing foundations and other structures underground, we, we read the soil. And so I had the engineer out there, we did sample that test hole. Um, there was no modeling found, no staining, uh, none, none of that. And it was dry. I, I, would dis, I would say 2022, maybe the summertime was a little bit dry, but mm -hmm. I, and I don't have the charts to, to tell you otherwise, but I would tell you that I have high confidence that there isn't a water table there that I'm going to contend with when I dig that cellar hole. And if there mm -hmm. is, we use stone and drainage uh, pipe to direct that. And that would be something that would go into the rain garden um, ultimately. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, and then let's go ahead and go back to uh, Ms. Anderson. Uh, Ms. Anderson, you're muted. Sorry. Um, my apologies. I remembered my question. Uh, when you look at the map that has both the red and the black, 
I'm not a mathematician, but it looks to me as if the amount of red is double the amount of the original black. So, um, and if it's not double, it's certainly very close to double. And it seems to me that there is gonna be a lot more destruction of the environment than the original plans would have called for. And if there wasn't a water problem before, if more destruction of the environment occurs, there will be a water problem because where this house is going is up into an area that is much wetter than the lower southern end of that property. That top end of the property behind the house that belongs to, um, oh, I can't remember, it used to be Janetti's. Anyway, up there behind their house, there's nothing but swamp year round. And now this house is being proposed to be higher, closer to that area. So I'm just concerned that an original plan was submitted and I get that the Conservation Commission has approved this, which I find appalling, but um, I don't understand how you can submit a plan for X amount of square feet of intrusion into an area. And then later on, redraw the plans, almost double the amount of intrusion and have that be acceptable. So I guess my question is, what's the percentage of increase of impact? And was this the only way that whatever they needed to do that for could be done. I mean, it seems to me there would be a lot of different ways to draw in the garage, like for instance, where that rectangle is right below the new garage, that could become the garage. And this house could then be put over that. I don't understand. This is like a driveway in search of a house. And now it's even worse. So I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned that the amount of impact in that area has been doubled. And I, I think that's a mistake. So at least I'm on record with some of the other people. Thank you, Thank Ms. You. Anderson. Mr. Reedy. Sure, uh, thanks a lot. Just for a uh, topic of discussion, I think this is the map uh, or plan rather uh, Ms. Anderson was commenting on. And so the um, building coverage actually goes down by 2.9%. So that's 1,260 feet, uh, square feet rather. Um, the approved plan for the building coverage was 3,140 square feet. Proposed is 1,880 square feet. So the building coverage goes down. The lot coverage does go up, um, but certainly not double. It goes up 4.9%. So 25% in, so it's RG zoning district. Um, lot coverage can be 40% just to put it into perspective, 25% can be building coverage. Um, the proposal is for 4.3% of building coverage, 17.7% of lot coverage. So that's going from 12.8% of lot coverage to 17.7% of lot coverage. Uh, 5,525 square feet of lot coverage is approved, 7,712 feet of lot coverage as proposed. So little less than a 5% increase from what was approved. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right. Let's take a look here. All right, I'm not seeing any other hands up right now. You can go ahead and stop sharing the screen for the moment now, Mr. Reedy. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. O'Connor, go ahead. Um, yeah, there was an issue that was raised earlier in the discussion, which was that Oh, wait, uh, um, Mr. O'Connor, just before you, you jump into that, because we're about to potentially go into deliberation where we can address all these issues. Um, I just want to gauge with the board uh, what we would like to do in this case right now. Of, I think we want to move into deliberation um, and open up the uh, public meeting portion of the meeting. Uh, my question to the board first is going to be, do we want to leave the public hearing open? Uh, I think if we believe that we're going to continue this to another meeting, it would be valuable to do so, so we can continue to solicit public input. Um, I just want to quickly get a sense, does, does the board think that's the good way to do this? Kind of a thumbs up, do we like that idea? Which, sorry, which way? Of keeping the public uh, hearing open as we move into the public meeting. That way, if we decide we would like to uh, continue this, uh, it will give us the uh, opportunity to continue to seek public uh, input between now and another meeting should we continue this. We all like that method? 
but, but I, I just don't understand. I, it, is it possible that after we have the public meeting that then we close the public hearing if we decided we didn't need any? Correct. It still, it still gives okay. us that option. It's, it's just procedurally. Um, I, I think that it's a good chance. I, I know I have some concerns that that may uh, that I might want to continue this, and I would like to keep it open so that the public can give input should this be continued to another meeting. Uh, unless anybody specifically wants to close off all public input, even if this gets continued. So if I could, Mr. Chair, for what it's worth, I don't think we, <laughs> if you're talking about continuing, I would say please don't close the public hearing because then we're up the creek. Okay, thank you. The, uh, so, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just go ahead. I, I want I want us to not lose sight of the the applicants um, discussion earlier about the fact that it's not likely that that they're going to be able to meet the deadline and therefore how how do we how do we bring the issue um, before the board of extending their deadline beyond uh, April was a 10th. So, um, I, but I think, I think we should be aware of that so that we can, we can take care of that. Um, make sure that we take care of that. And if we're gonna give ourselves more time, one of the aspects of that is to extend their deadline. Thank you, I, I agree with that, Mr. O'Connor. We will, we will have the ability to do so um to do exactly that uh so i guess what i'm, I'm just going to do here is i'm going to uh move that we keep the um the public hearing open and that we will go ahead and we'll also open up the public meeting for zba fy 2018-03 and zba uh fy 2020-18 uh wilson properties group llc request for approval of submissions and fulfillment of condition 10 of the special permit ZBA FY 2018-03 as extended by ZBA FY 2020-18, uh, which requires acceptance or modification of the management plan at a ZBA public meeting and condition 12, which requires that the project shall be built uh, according to the approved plan with any substantial deviation to return to the ZBA for review at a public meeting, map 11D, parcels 281, uh, 189, and uh, 194. Uh, so I'm making the motion to do so. Do I have a second? Second. Chair Marshall, uh, second. Uh, so chair votes aye. Uh, Ms. Marshall? Aye. Uh, Ms. Parks? Aye. Uh, Mr. Meadows? Aye. Uh, and Mr. O'Connor? Aye. Excellent. All right. So the uh, public hearing. Uh, sorry, the public meeting is now open. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, I know you were uh, trying to get in before I cut you off, so so please go ahead. This is now the portion where the board can uh, deliberate on what's been presented before us. Well, I, um, the first thing I'd like us to do is to is to uh, entertain a motion to extend the deadline for the applicants because obviously, if we're going to keep the public hearing open it's not likely that this matter is going to be resolved in time for them to meet the deadline, which was going to be difficult anyway. So if, if we could do that piece of business, then I think it would be easier to address other issues that we might consider at a public meeting. So Certainly. if I could make a motion that we extend the deadline uh, that was previously um, uh, imposed by the the zoning the, the zoning board in I think 2020 um, of uh, of April 10th and extend that till June 10th. Um, I I don't the applicant would obviously might want to have something to say about it, but I I would like to give them. Uh, and, and ourselves sufficient time to to resolve this um, to to as many people's satisfaction as is possible. 
Uh, Mr. Reedy, is, is June 10th uh, acceptable for just with what's currently in front of us, extending that deadline to June 10th? And Ms. Prestrup had her hand up. I don't know if she wanted to speak before I spoke. Ms. Prestrup? I would like to ask Mr. Mara if it's um, something that can be done, given the fact that this is not um, an application for a special permit. It is a submittal to meet um, conditions. So is it possible within this um, public hearing and public meeting to extend that deadline, Mr. Mara? So typically the extensions are treated as, uh, you know, amendment applications to a prior special permit. Uh, the 2020 permit had a deadline of, you know, that was established by that. So it seems to me that this is not an application to do that. Um, it's simply a review of condition nine uh, with the house layout and screening uh, and, and nothing more than that. Go ahead, Ms. Marshall. Yeah, I'm unclear what what the deadline that maybe Mr. Reedy or, or Mr. Wilson had mentioned earlier. That what what, what <laughs> explain that? Is this the permit expires at that point? What is deadline yes. we're talking about? Thank you. Uh, it, yes, the, as my understanding is at April 9th, if um, construction has not begun on this permit, the permit expires and there is no longer a special condition. Uh, for this property is, is my understanding of, of what's happening. Um, am I correct about that, Mr. Reedy? Is that what you understand? Yeah, let me, maybe I'll unpack it just a little bit. So there was that 2018 uh, special permit that was extended in 2020. Your special permits last for two years unless it's exercised. And there's a few different ways to, to exercise those special permits. So when that 2021, it, 2020 special permit extension issued, then we hit COVID. And um, there's a calculation that you can do. It was from, I think, March 13th of that year. And I think if you had 185 days on the expiration, the removal of that state of emergency, which would bring us to the April 10th, 2023 date. And so the, the question is whether or not we have exercised that special permit. Um, you know, in, in looking at the special permit this evening, the special permit is for three lots, right? It's for the two flag lots and the main lot, so-called. And so when I had previously thought about this, I was thinking of just those flag lots and whether or not the conveyance from the Fabos family to Wilson Properties was sufficient to exercise, because there's case law out there that conveying a lot that wouldn't otherwise be able to be conveyed, but for here, a special permit, um, if that was in fact exercising. And when it was going just to Wilson Properties, frankly, I thought probably not. But now thinking about it, and I would defer to Mr. Moore, who's ultimately the zoning enforcement officer, um, given that one of the properties, the Fabos property, is part of the special permit technically because it was you know, the main lot and the two flag lots, and that that property was conveyed to someone else who's actually appeared this evening, I would suggest that we have in fact exercised that permit. Um, in the alternative, if Mr. Mora doesn't agree with that analysis, then I think what we would like to do is submit maybe tomorrow uh, an application for an amendment um, just to have a belt and suspenders approach if that would be satisfactory. So I, I would suggest, you know, if Mr. Mora agrees with the exercise being that conveyance to uh, Gaston and his family, then we don't need that extension and we're, we're just dealing with uh, this condition and then working through it with, with everybody here, uh, or if it is needed, whether or not an application would be um, appropriate. So that's, like always, I turn to Rob for the answer. So I was comfortable with that. Um, you know, I think I had mentioned this before that, um, but, I, but I think, you know, Mr. Reedy representing his applicant has to be comfortable with it as well in case there's a challenge, but uh, I was comfortable with the project proceeding as being exercised upon the conveyance. Um, you know, so that's where I would issue the building permit if it was in front of me uh, to do so. Uh, I don't think there's time for an extension, even if it was filed tomorrow. Uh, I think, uh, you know, what we were up against is the board making a decision tonight. We have an application that's ready to move along uh, 
so that work could proceed. And that would be the, the sure way to make sure that that something happens and the, the permit is, um, it, it survives, uh, you know, beyond the April 10th date. So if I'm understanding this correct, uh, the only certain way to ensure that this permit doesn't expire is to make a decision on it tonight. Am I correct about that? Yeah, I guess I'll say uh, I'll say maybe a little more confidently that I think the permit has been exercised, and I'm not concerned about it expiring myself. Um, but if that is a concern of anybody's, the reason to the the only way to ensure that there isn't a question about that that goes on any longer than April 10th is for the board to make a decision tonight, and for the applicant to move pretty aggressively with fulfilling the requirements of the building permit application process and starting work. Uh, and, you know, the discussion about how wet it may or may not be and whether or not they want to start now or in June, you, you know, I, don't, I have no idea what could happen uh, in that case. All right. Um, so, I mean, as long as Mr. Moore and, and Mr. Reedy are, are both comfortable saying this is being exercised, and I'm, I'm not going to have that be too much of a concern for us then. Um, so, looks like kind of what we've got here uh it's as we talked about before it's condition nine um new owners will accept the modified condition nine ten and twelve uh, is what's before us here and given that uh it is a substantial deviation uh from the approved plan in terms of uh what's being put on the lot i do think we have um stop me if i'm mistaken uh uh, Mr. Moore, Mr. or uh, Ms. Prestrup, but uh, I think we have pretty broad authority in, in uh, that approval process of that. I know uh, something I, I know the applicant had mentioned, uh, I think at our site visit was they were open to um, gravel uh, as a material for the driveway to help address concerns on flooding. I think something like that. Do we have the, we have the ability to uh, impose that am i correct about something like that or would that just be procedurally for for something like this is that just something we would say if that can be done we would approve it uh or what would i guess be your i'm opinion? a little i'm a little um cautious about how the conservation commission would view that my guess is the conservation commission would view it positively because it means that the site would be absorbing more water but it is a change from the plan that they approved so um that would be a question i would have and maybe mr mora has some some comments to make there too i'll just add that i think as mentioned earlier you know, this isn't resulting in a decision that will have a set of conditions. We're not amending any other conditions. So, you know, it almost becomes a, a negotiation with the applicant of what, you know, what this, what the changes would be and an understanding that that's the plan that is approved tonight. Um, in fact, the condition only says that the board reviews it. It doesn't say that the board approves it, um, you know, which might be the next step in the discussion if needed. Uh, so I would, you know, I would suggest that, you know, it's, it's appropriate to ask for something that would help the board be supportive of the proposal that's in front of us and hope that the applicant is, is open to doing that. Uh, I think this, this hearing will end up with a, a written summary of what occurred, but not a specific set of conditions that would be enforceable. Uh, so it really has to result in a plan that is agreed upon. Uh, I'm sorry, just one more question and then I'll, I'll, I'll get to you, Ms. Marshall. Um, and for this as well, do we need to make specific findings or we don't need to make specific findings for it because they've already been made for this project? Am I correct about that? You're correct. Yeah, there's no findings to be made tonight. Um, it's just uh, acknowledging the review of the uh, proposed plan that and screening that is different from the original application. Got it, Ms. Marshall. Yeah, I, I would be uh, very wary of asking for any alteration in the driveway plan um, because the CONCOM has approved it. I certainly don't have the knowledge to second guess whether what they have decided is, is adequate. Um, 
And while clearly some abutters are very concerned about water, that doesn't seem to be something that we get to review. <laughs> get to review. So, you know, I hear all that, but um, it, those concerns don't arise specifically because of the change in the building, you know, its shape or its orientation. I think it's just a general concern with building on the site. So I don't see why that there's anything we can really do about that. Um, so Mr. Meadows? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, did I cut you off, Ms. Marshall? Oh. I, 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 I would agree with you that, you know, asking for a permeable surface on the driveway is a reasonable ask, similar to the ask for the holly trees rather than, or pollinators rather than the, the evergreens. I think that if we can get a, a permeable surface, it will assist in the uh, angst about water. And I can't imagine that the compound would have any objections to say something of that sort. And um, my understanding too, it's a uh, concern for flooding uh, for, for residents is definitely uh, in the purview of, of the ZBA uh, in terms of its impact on flooding or not flooding uh, in terms of its impact on wetland is, is outside. Um, our, certainly our expertise, but even that is, is a condition that we, we make and usually refer to the, uh, the ComCon in terms of whether or not that condition is met. Um, so yeah, I think I'm, I'm getting the sense that this is really, if this is really just a review, are we, um, are we approving? I, I guess I'm not understanding this then, then are we just a, a, approving anything or we're just accepting that we've reviewed it? Um, procedurally here, uh, kind of what, uh, what are we doing here with the review? Well, I'll jump in. I think it's a good question. I think the condition isn't written the way it typically would be written to say review and approved. Um, I think the applicant might be looking for your approval tonight and, and would like to, to hear that. Uh, but I think if if things went the other way, it will uh, certainly uh, generate a discussion to happen more seriously about that question that hopefully we don't have to address. I think, uh, um, Moore hit, I think he hit the nail on the head. I mean, as, as written, I don't know how much you can actually do, but I think, you know, we're here in good faith to figure out if there's a way to get to that, uh, that yes answer. So and I think, you know, before we get into maybe permeable versus impermeable or what that actually means, I'd like to hear kind of what else people have on the table and then maybe we could take it as a, as a group. Got it. Thank you. Uh, questions from, from other board members or concerns? What, uh, what's on anybody else's mind here on this one? Any, uh, anything else anybody wants to get into or, or should we start addressing that? Mr. Meadows? If, if we're having an approval, we have to, uh, then that's a, approval with conditions it, it you know if all we're doing is rubber stamping then what are we doing here yeah i think i i, I think it is definitely uh a word in a very strange way where we're we are reviewing um but it does sound like as mr reedy said you know they are they are amenable to this so i guess what are concerns i think i said my concern here is uh, I, I'd like to see a gravel driveway if that can be done. I know you've said that you'd like to see holly trees uh, in there as well. So I guess, is there is there anything else that we'd like to see? I know Mr. O'Connor talked about a little bit about lighting in there as well. So if, if we can just find common ground that us and the applicants all just agree on, that would, uh, would make this really help us avoid the question of what the hell are we doing here tonight because we've gotten approved uh because yeah i guess we could all walk away and say we did in fact review the plan it was reviewed none of us liked it but we sure reviewed it so it's it's a little hard to say so yeah i guess the idea here of uh let's let's find common ground first and then and then maybe we can we can avoid having to deal with that question uh so uh any anything from any else here about uh, concerns they might have Ms. Marshall. Yeah, I've never 
uh, had a gravel driveway, nor have I lived at the bottom of a gravel driveway. I really don't know whether if in a heavy rainstorm or, you know, plows, it's just going to end up depositing a lot of gravel in the street or on the property. I mean, I, I understand that it's more permeable, but it can also move. So I just don't know that it would really be in some, a, it would be better, so. Sarah, come up to my house tomorrow. <laughs> well, you don't live on a hill like this. <laughs> but my driveway is sloped. Ah. Well, I don't know if the builders or Mr. Moore, anybody, you know, knows the grade is low, you know, low enough that that's just not a concern or what. I, I just don't know. Well, I guess I guess I'll say this where I know uh, looking at that slope, uh, the two houses um, and you're walking up the driveway, the one behind, I know Mr. De Los Reyes's house and the house just to your left, I think are, are probably the two that will be uh, most impacted from concerns from flooding. So I, I guess if this is really just a review and we're not imposing conditions and just, you know, having a discussion of what we'd like to see. Honestly, I'd like to, to have that uh, discussion done, see that uh, perhaps maybe the applicant talking to a butters to see, you know, which would they prefer? Do they prefer a, uh, a uh, paved driveway versus a gravel driveway? Um, you know, maybe have that discussion, but at the end of the day, it doesn't look like we're putting a condition on here. So, you know, it still opens it up for them to say, we'd like, we'd like gravel. And then to turn around and say, well, we hear you and uh, we're building pavement. So could happen, but uh, it's something I'd like to see, you know, just in, in terms of trying to be good neighbors here. I know uh, if it can be done, I'd like to see it. Uh, anything from anybody else uh, in terms of that? We've got Holly, we've got that, Mr. O'Connor. Yes, um, so my sense of things from listening to the discussion is the issue of the implementation of the permit is to my mind resolved. Um, and and it, it seemed clear from the applicant that they are not likely to begin work. Um, I, I heard their timetable. Um, I'm, I would be happy to allow what you just talked about to happen and also perhaps for the applicant to run by uh, the Conservation Commission, some of the alternatives, the alternatives that have come up at this meeting to see what they say and make sure that we get um, a, a, a very um, cogent uh, uh, response from the Conservation Commission uh, in terms of alternatives to what they've, they've um, already approved. Um, if, if the applicant doesn't need to go do something by April 10th, then um, I don't see any reason not to allow a little more interaction to happen. And which may, I think, lead to greater satisfaction by a larger number of people. Uh. As I, as I continue to read that, it, it, it does seem almost implicit that there is approval here because what is review anyways, if, if this kind of opens us up to submitting it review, uh, could, could they come back with a uh, multifamily home that uh, is nothing like the original plan? We're just here to simply review that? I, 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 don't, I don't think so, but in, in terms of that, I think it seems like I'm, I'm, I'm getting a sense from the board that there is a general agreement in what direction we want to go with in terms of this. Am I, am I getting that sense, Ms. Parks? 
I just want to say that I'm okay with a plan as is. Um, I think that the owner spent a lot of time with the Conservation Commission and looking at the wetlands and figuring out the best way to go. They made the driveway some part paved and some part gravel in order to handle the water situation. For me, if I imagine a fire truck driving up a gravel hill like that, I don't see that that is workable. And so I, it makes sense to me to do the paved portion and the gravel portion. I, they retained the water, the rain garden. Um, the building was moved to. Did we lose Ms. Parks? Is anybody else not seeing? Tammy? Water issues. Terrific I points too. Well, you know, and I, I lived in, in downtown Amherst and I had water in my basement and there are places in Amherst that are very moist. And it it's a, I don't, for me, I don't see that the addition of this house that is very, really placed and the only place that can be placed if you're placing it around all of these wetland areas, I, I don't think it's going to make the water problem worse. However, if it does, didn't they say that they would take care of that? And so it seems to me like they've thought of, of each side. I mean, if the concern is they're not going to comply with that, well, that's we have the concern in every house in Amherst and every building in Amherst, because you can't, you know, if people don't comply, they don't comply. But for me, looking at this, I it seems to me very well thought out. And honestly, you know, I've we've done some building. Sometimes you can only put it in one place. If you're trying to you know, conserve, you know, take care of the wetlands, then they are putting the building in the only place it can be put in, you know? So that's what I have to say about it. I, I'm okay with, with this as it is. I've reviewed it. I went there. I'm comfortable with this. I'm, you know, I'm sorry that the neighbors have water problems. I, I don't believe that this will cause further water problems. Um, it's possible. But again, that to me, that has been addressed. So I am not uncomfortable with this plan. I, as far as we, we I, I don't know what we're doing. So any of those things. And, you know, and also about the arborvitae and the holly. You know, if the arborvitae you grow faster, then let's put them so that they are blocking the two houses where they might see each other and put holly the other place. I mean, I think the builder is amenable to those changes. You know, the only thing that I'd throw in is I certainly hope you send it, sell it to a family. You know, that would be a nice thing. We want some families in Amherst. We need more families in Amherst. Please build it so that a family can purchase this house. That's my two cents. I'm done. Thank you, Ms. Parks. Um, yeah, if board members do feel that uh, we have enough to uh, approve the review here tonight, uh, I can certainly entertain a motion for that. If we have any other comments or concerns, I'd, I'd like to, to hear it. Go ahead, Mr. O'Connor. No, just procedurally, if I, I think if we're going to take a vote on um, tonight, I think we have to close the public hearing. Yeah. Correct. I, yes, procedurally, we would need to. Um, yeah. My mistake on that. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Marshall. Yeah, you, I think you just said that maybe we are ready to uh, approve it, but I thought we weren't approving. So what would we vote? We would say, thank you very much for showing us your revised plan. Goodbye. You know, I, I'm just wondering, Pretty we, don't, we should be careful if we're making a motion that we don't even like, it's not something we're doing in the first place. Go ahead, Ms. Brestrup. I would recommend approving it. I mean, if you think it's a good plan, I would recommend approving it, not just acknowledging the review. I think it's important to make that statement. Thank you. I think we we, we only uh, are going to be coming into that issue of uh, we're not all uh, in agreement with uh, with the applicant of this or in trying to impose new conditions. Um, so I mean, with that being said, uh, do we think we're all comfortable moving on, closing the public hearing and uh, Moving to the next portion here. So I'd entertain a motion to close the public hearing as well as a motion to uh, close the close the public hearing and the public meeting. I believe we can do that as one motion. Am I correct about that? 
if I could, Mr. Chair, just before you get into that, I wouldn't close the public meeting if I were you. No. Um, but uh, I think, you know, we've talked about a couple of different things. I would agree with wholeheartedly with uh, Ms. Parks about the gravel versus what's, you know, what goes to my mind is this is a plan that's been engineered. It's, they understand how the water is going to flow based on what was designed. If you start to change the medium, then you're starting to change the water flow and then the whole plan ultimately changes. So I would respectfully suggest we take that off the table based on the amount of review that's happened. The Holly and the Arborvitaes, I think, kind of like Ms. Parks again mentioned, you know, maybe Arb's behind and then Holly's for the rest. Maybe that's a good medium be between the two. And then to Mr. O'Connor's point about the lighting, you know, we would rely on what the current uh, condition says as far as downcast, dark sky compliant lighting, understanding, you know, what that actually means is, um, you know, that with the screening, I think probably gets us there. So um, just from our perspective. Marshall? Yeah, just so I'm, so I understand um, the impact. If we close the pub if public hearing, but then we don't, a, a, a motion to approve this fails, then what? Then we would have to reopen a public, I mean, just can you explain what, what happens once we've, or what are the risks perhaps of closing the public hearing? You, you can take the vote while the, and if Ms. Brustrup or Mr. Moore wants to correct me, but you can take the vote while the public hearing is still open. Okay. And then subsequent to that, then you can move to close the public hearing and close the public meeting. I don't know that it has to be deliberative session with a public meeting to actually take the vote. You can keep it all open, take that vote, and then close the other two. So just in case there's not a consensus of it and we are continued, because right. then the, the alternative is reconsideration of a motion by somebody who has, in fact, blah, blah, blah. so we can avoid that. But I'll obviously defer to town staff. Uh, it's times like when we have to deal with procedure. Do I really miss Steve Judge being here? But uh, <laughs> that being said, let's uh, <laughs> let's go ahead, Miss Brestrup. So we did run into a problem um, recently, and uh, I spoke with Mr. Mora, and he said that it is possible to reopen a public hearing within a public meeting. In other words, if you close the public hearing now, and then you deliberated, and you realized you wanted to open the public hearing, as long as it's within the same meeting. You can do that. It's not a preferred way to do things, but it is possible. All right. So procedurally, just so we can move forward, we're, we can leave everything open and then make a motion right now to, even though it's technically not what's here, but we're going to go ahead and make a, a motion to approve the, the plan as is, is written. Am, am I correct about that procedurally? That's how, yeah, how we can okay um all right so in that case as long as we can do that and everyone's all right with that i would i would entertain such a motion so moved Ms. parks moves do we have a second i'll second uh, miss marshall seconds uh chair votes aye miss parks aye miss marshall aye mr meadows aye uh mr o'connor Okay, so the motion that we're voting on now is uh, is is to approve the uh, the plan as is has been presented to us. Uh, this is specifically on uh, related to with conditions nine, uh, ten, and twelve. Am I correct? With with what's before us in uh, FY. 2018-03 uh, and FY 2020-18. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that part of this is a management plan that you're approving. So you're approving the plan that we've looked at. Mm -hmm. You're approving the fact that the builder is going to build it in accordance with that plan, which is condition nine. And then you're also approving condition 10, the submission with regard to uh, condition 10, which regard relates to the management plan. So it's really three things. Correct. So, so if you, if, so you still have to record my vote. Yep. Okay, I, I, I think the 
the applicant has demonstrated openness to concerns about the screening and the and the timetable for the installation of the screen. I think he, they're covered by a number of other things. I haven't heard an alternative plan that I feel comfortable voting would, would persuade me to vote no. So I, I'm willing to approve this. Um, I think the applicant though has, has a, has a barrier if if there are there are water problems, um, the applicant's going to hear about it uh, in in a way that might be much more uncomfortable than this discussion. Uh, and that is that a an I or a, a name? Mr. Yes, that, that I mean I've I've said that that I'll I'll prove it because I haven't heard an alternative plan that I think. Uh, has has any has behind it what the applicant has presented. But on the other hand, I think we all of our approvals are with the understanding that um, that compliance is the is the order of the day. If compliance isn't achieved, then there's going to be a problem that's much bigger than tonight's problem. But. Uh Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, so we record your vote as, as I, am I correct? Yes. Thank you. All right, that's uh, five to zero. Uh, the plan is approved. Um, now I would, uh, I guess, say up. Yeah, thank you for, for coming on in, Mr. Reedy, and Mr. Wilson. Um, mm -hmm. Did you include you closing the public close hearing? Yeah. We need a motion to close the public hearing. Yeah, so we, Keep them here for the, the closing then. I'll, we'll accept the, uh, do we have a motion to, to close? So moved. Uh, excellent. Motion to close the public hearing in the public meeting. Do we have a second? Second. Ms. Marshall seconds. Uh, chair votes aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Ms. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. O'Connor. Aye. All right, that's five to zero. The uh, public meeting and the public hearing are closed. Thank you right. very much. With that Great in mind, job. thank you so much, Mr. Reedy. Thank you so much, Mr. Wilson, for coming on in tonight. We'll see you. Thank you as well. Thank you. All right. Um, so now we will move on to we have um, discussion that's uh, that's empty. So that's just go ahead, Miss uh, Miss Parks. I just wanted to say thank you to the to the neighbors and other people who came and shared. It was part of the review. It's really important that you were here. Please continue to come to things and be heard. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Marshall. Yeah, um, I hope this is the right place to mention this. It's my understanding that our ability to meet virtually is going to expire at the end of the month. Is that Ms. Brestrup has her hand. Yeah. So the um, the Senate and the House have both voted vo both voted separately to allow um, the remote meetings to continue until the end of March of 2025. They need to reconcile their votes, and they are working on that now. Yeah. Um, there is language that has been given to us by our town attorney that allows us to. Um, submit legal ads to the Gazette with language saying, um, you know, if we are still able to hold meetings remotely, we're going to do it that way. But if not, then the meeting is going to be held in the town room of the town hall. And so um, if you want to see it in the flesh, you can look at it. Um, I think there's an ad that appeared in the Gazette today for a meeting that's happening on the 6th of April, so you could check that out. But um, so we believe that we will be able to continue to hold meetings virtually. Mr. McCarthy. I would just like to inform you all, Mr. O'Connor had to leave. Got it. Uh, all so right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. O'Connor. If there's And it's still my opinion that independent of 
what the town may want to do, I think we should meet uh, in public. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Um, go, go ahead, Ms. Marshall. Yeah, I was just going to say that just because we may be permitted to meet virtually, I, I hope that is something we would discuss. I know actually I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say we actually did have a, a discussion about that. Uh, I think last meeting, um, I, I, I think the, 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 the general consensus as it stands right now, I think it was me, Mr. O'Connor, uh, and uh, Mr. Judge are of the feeling that we prefer uh, in person if we could. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Gilbert uh, was of the opinion of he's a, he's a no vote. And then uh, Ms. Parks, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I was getting the sense of, uh, of a no, no vote as well. So there's a little bit of a, uh, a division here of what we'd like to see, but uh, you can count me in on team. I'd like to meet in person if we could. Uh, I, think, I think there's a general consensus that we would all love to do uh, a, a hybrid method, um, but it's way, I, I think it's just kind of, kind of, kind of wait and see kind of what happens. But if you're on team meet in person, don't worry, I'm right there. <laughs> I'm right there with you. How do you feel about it, Craig? or uh, uh go ahead sir if the next meeting is when and i'm going to be in colombia the way i have taken other meetings got it so that's i i cannot possibly do in-person meetings is it uh is it safe to say that your your team team remote if it comes down to it exactly it well if that's if that's the price it takes to keep you on here i don't know i might i might be a little bit more in favor of remote i guess the uh what were you gonna say Ms. marshall oh it, it doesn't matter to me it's certainly very convenient <laughs> just to walk into walk to the computer and sit down but it's no hardship for me to get to town hall either so got it uh miss parks can't hear you Uh, still muted. Muted. Sorry, I got it. Um, for me, it's all about access because wherever people are, uh, you know, if there's property owners who are not around, if there are people who are homebound for whatever reason, if there's any reason why it's difficult for someone to get into a car and go someplace and wait for three hours, or many people have to wait for a couple of hours before their turn comes up, then to me, this, this, gives greater access. But I also, you know, one of my other points is that um, it is intimidating actually for some people to come before a board that's kind of raised above them, looking down at them and go to a microphone and speak and also have people behind them who may agree or disagree with them, but to feel that pressure. And so I think that this does relieve some of that pressure um, for people who would feel intimidated by that. So that's my reasons. I know I, I, I feel sometimes that uh, it, it's hard to even have a discussion on Zoom because when I'm just sitting in my room empty talking at my iPad, I just, just I don't know, I, I don't, I just hear my own voice reading the preamble is so difficult being like, wow, I'm still going, I'm still <laughs> talking, <laughs> it's just in my empty room on and on that I don't know, I, 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 I like that, that feeling of being together um it it facilitates for me just an, an easier time talking where i you know i think it's it's a little bit of a trade-off i think some people yeah do find it you know difficult and intimidating and i understand that but i in my case i find it difficult to to sit here in my room and and, and talk and try to stay as engaged uh you know so that's that's me but well i like working with you folks so you know that's that's tough. Got to got to got to go with what works. The um, we'll have a we'll have another chance to talk a, a little bit more, but I just want to get to um, public comment for any issue that was not before the board tonight. So anything that that was not related to uh, the two agenda items we have. Do we have anyone from the public who wishes to speak? All right, um, 
seeing no hands raised, we will go to other business not anticipated within uh, the next 48 hours. Uh, do we have any such business? No, we don't. Uh, do we need to uh, make set up the next meeting time uh, before we adjourn? The next meeting time is April 6th, I believe. It is currently April March 23rd, so the next meeting is April 6th, and at that time you'll be talking about a um, proposal. Ms. Marshall has a question. We meet on the second and fourth Thursdays, that would be the 13th and the 20th. I mean, there was a is two weeks away, but I thought we were asked to book and I have the second and fourth Thursdays. That's true, if I may. But at some point in the past, the board agreed to meet on April 6th. I can't remember exactly when that was, but um, there and I believe that you will not therefore be meeting on April 13th that you'll meet on April 6th and April 27th. And um, there was a reason for that. And if I go back in my notes, I'll be able to reconstruct that. But we've already advertised a public hearing for April 6th for um, a battery storage facility um, at 515 Sunderland Road. So I hope that you will be able to come on April 6th. I thought I had asked and people had said they could attend on April 6th. But that was the and maybe I'm not needed, but I can't I cannot attend. Okay, that's thank a you. holiday. So uh, the okay. So I know the fifth is the first night of Passover. And is the sixth also Monday? Night? It's Monday, Thursday. Monday, Thursday. Ah. Before, before Good Friday. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so hopefully you didn't need me anyway. Easter. Um, yeah. Uh, do we have any other business not anticipated within 48 hours? No. All right. Uh, in that case, I would, uh, I would accept a motion to adjourn. So uh, moved. Uh, give it to uh, <laughs> Mr. Meadows moves, Ms. Parks with the second. Uh, we'll go ahead, take a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Uh, Mr. Meadows. Aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Ms. Marshall. Aye. And Mr. Connell, uh, Mr. O'Connell is absent. That's four to zero to one. Uh, we are adjourned at eight twenty-four. All right. Well, thank you all. all right. It was uh, fun times. We got through it though. Thank you for chairing, Mr. Maxfield. Yes, thank you. Thank you for chairing. What's that? I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> it was. Uh, it was a blast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thank all you right. all. And uh, I'll see most of you.